So to make these infrared trichromes, you will need uh, some infrared film. So here I have Roly infrared, and it comes in 35 millimeter and 120, as well as four by five. Um, there is an Ilford SFX 200 version that has infrared sensitivity, but I particularly like this Roly infrared just because it is available in four by five, so I can recreate the same looks um, that I shoot on 35 in large format um, and there's some really impressive work that's that's being done in the in the space there so next with your infrared film you're going to need an r72 filter so this is from hoya and uh, hoya is just a lens filter brand the important part here again is the r72 bit of the filter you should be able to see here yep um, and the R72 indicates that it's the threshold at 720 nanometers. And here I have a 58 millimeter filter thread that matches the lens I'll show you later uh, in this video. So to show you the filter, um, it's quite opaque. So um, again, as you look at things here, it should be totally opaque uh, in that you can't see through it at all. It blocks um, pretty much all of the, the visible light uh, up until you get to the infrared part of the spectrum. When you look at a super bright light source, you'll get like a faint pink white uh, off tone that, that comes out, but this is what's gonna uh, allow us to stimulate the film without overpowering it with the visible color layers. So next, I like to stack my infrared filter with a red filter. So pretty much all infrared filters um, are built in a similar fashion, but some are higher quality than others. So my Hoya is, it's not super high end and there is some uh, light leak that, that pops through. So I like having uh, this red filter as an option just because it allows me to cut out more and more and more of that uh, high energy light and gives me the option to avoid um, accidentally stimulating the film in a way that I don't want it to um, on the long end. So I'll typically stack, this is a 25A filter, uh, and I'll stack it with the R72 filter for an even deeper uh, red filter. And so we're doing a trichrome, so three colors you need are red, green, and blue. Uh, the next option I have up here is actually a uh, green filter. And noticeably, it might be a little small on the text here to see, but this is a 61 green filter. And you'll notice that this green filter is fairly dark. Um, so it's actually designed for applications like this where you're going to trichrome things and um, exclusively look at the area of light outside of the green spectrum. So this filters out all the green, which is quite nice. Just to show you a comparison in terms of how, how much strength there is, um, I have a green 11 filter right here. And to show you the difference, um, the first green filter that I showed here, which is the 61, is a little bit darker um, and more intense than that 11 green. You could probably get by with using a um, in 11 green, but I prefer to kind of do it the right way. So just good things to know. And the final filter that you will need is a blue filter. So here we're using a 47B blue filter. Again, all of these are from Tiffin. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be, but it's nice to have that as an option. Again, this deep blue is different than you'd traditionally expect from a blue color correction filter. Um, it filters out all of the pigment associated with blue. Um, so yeah, I have one, two, three, uh, four filters. So I stack the, again, 25A with the infrared filter. I have this 47B blue and then the 61 green. Now for the lens for this filter, I'm actually using a Carl Zeiss planar lens. Uh, which I particularly like the look of. And this planar, it's a T-Star lens, um, Canon EF mount. Uh, and I really like it just because it was made at the end of the film digital sort of transition era. 
and has the electrical contacts that you would expect from an EF mount lens. So you can control the aperture uh, quite easily and also the uh, speed you'd expect from a, a traditional Fast 50. And I really like the, the character this, that this lens has. It, it has the vintage adapted to mirrorless aesthetic without having to deal with the headache of not having any EXIF or exposure data. Um, and I really like uh, the final look. So big fan of this lens. Again, you can use it on film or digital. Um, so here we're gonna use it for film on my Canon. Next up, um, the camera body I'm using is the Canon EOS A2. Um, so it's a film camera body that was built um, during the transition again from that film to digital era. So it has all of the accoutrements of digital cameras. We have the EF mount, electrical contacts, autofocus. Um, I have a vertical grip on this. It shoots seven frames a second with film, which is crazy. The only difference is the back here. Again, um, you have that nice shutter gate, auto rewind, um, and really cleans things up. So I'm a big fan of this, this camera. Um, and it allows me to meter pretty accurately as well. And because the infrared uh, film is originally ISO 400, but you have to filter out a lot of that light. It ends up being around ISO 12. So here I have a cable release um, that's electronic for uh, my Canon. So of course this would be specific to the camera that you're using. Um, I like it because it allows me to again trigger the shutter, shutter without having um, without having to disturb the, the tripod or where the, uh, the camera is placed. Um, again, I mentioned uh, that I'd be shooting this on a tripod. So this is the clip I'm using. I have a tiny Manfrotto tripod. It works pretty well. Um, I'm a big fan of the trade-offs between lightness and stability. Um, so I'll pop it onto my film camera before we shoot. Where things begin to get exciting um, is whenever we can bring these technologies from film into the digital era. So right here I have the Kolari Pocket. Um, it's like a digicam from the early 2000s. It um, has a nice grip that they added on here to make it a little bit less slippery. Um, basic auto exposure functions um, and it's adapted to fit uh, uh, modern SD cards of course and then um, this threaded ring, if you see up right here, is where you'll th thread on uh, the filters that are available. So this is a full spectrum conversion, meaning that it's sensitive to ultraviolet and infrared areas of the light spectrum. So if you're trying to do normal photography, it's actually not helpful unless you have the proper filters. So here, uh, Kalari has provided me with this. Um, it's called the IR Chrome filter. Um, you should be able to see that. Right about there, yeah. And the text is a little hard to get on the edge of the uh, edge of the device itself. Let me see if I can focus in. Much better. Yep. Um, and so this uh, IR Chrome lens filter will be uh, screwed onto the front here. So. I will do that now. And boom, we're set up and ready to go. So I'm excited to share, um, sort of comparing and contrasting what these infrared looks um, look like whenever uh, you're looking at the digital versus film version. Um, my guess is they'll have different character, but they could be quite similar. So. I don't know if I'll have a strong preference one way or the other. Um, I haven't shot with this yet, uh, but I'm going to take it out with my friend uh, later today to get some portraits. Uh, traditionally, people use these infrared cameras for um, things like landscapes, and I'm trying to sort of think outside a little outside of the box and um, take some portraits. Uh, hello YouTube, here with my friend Lauren, she's modeling today, um, and we're whipping out some trichromes on infrared film, um, and then also using the Kolari Vision IR chrome filter on digital camera, so we'll get to see that comparison between film and digital, and I'll uh, drop in with some clips throughout the day, but let's get started. So here we go, uh, so breakdown of this look with Lauren, uh, we were out, I was focused on finding some greenery, 
because the infrared light will actually reflect uh, back into the camera for anything that's living or green. So grasses, vines, trees, they'll all be different shades of pink and red, uh, but overall uh, they present that same aesthetic. So to review, we're using that trichrome, having red, green, and blue filters, and uh, we basically take each image and stitch it back together in Photoshop after processing. So we have to compensate for the exposure differences in each of those filters. And as you can see, here's a quick overview of the result. Um, it has the traditional slight yellow tinge to the skin tones that uh, a Kodak Aerochrome would have without the Aerochrome cost, albeit it is more complicated as you see me going back and forth and adding different filters, adjusting the exposure. I will say it's better to manually meter these, even if you have a good uh, internal meter, just because of the color sensitivity of many different light meters and the intensities that, that are involved. That said, um, I think the whole process is not overly complicated. Um, if you're intimidated by infrared, give uh, regular trichromes a shot uh, using just red, green, and blue filters. And uh, if you want to scroll back to earlier in the video, you can reference and see what filters I used. Those are all good for regular trichromes as well. Uh, the only thing in addition is the infrared film and the R72 filter that uh, result in that different look. So here's the second example I have of Lauren popping up on the screen. Um, again, those light tinge in the skin tones and the yellow. Um, interestingly, she's wearing all black, and I found that synthetic fabrics actually reflect uh, infrared light, uh, meaning that they don't actually block the UV. Noticeably, it's not too clear in her boots, but uh, her boots were leather, and those actually did not reflect lights. So they stayed black. I was hoping to get an all monochromatic black outfit, so the emphasis would be on the scene, but you get visual surprises when you're working in, in experimental photography, so it's something that could happen. So here's a direct comparison of the film trichrome on the right, uh, the rolly infrared, and then the digital shot on the left, which is with the Kolari pocket uh, full spectrum camera. It's a little point and shoot with the IR chrome filter. Um, I will note that this first shoot with Lauren was actually shot in JPEG only. Um, I had not figured out how to turn on the raw files. Uh, in the CHDK uh, memory card uh, that's provided with the Colari Pocket. So apologies there, but I still think the images turned out really nice. You got some bright poppy reds and blues. Um, there is a little bit of discoloration in the highlights, but you'll see that is fixed whenever I turn on the raw shoot later with my friend, Rachel. So overall, love the process. The digital is super simple. Um, you can really have dynamic poses from the models, and then the film has that classic look with the grain you would expect, uh, but it is a little more complex. Now moving on, uh, that uh, comparison I mentioned earlier between RAW and JPEG. So here we're looking at JPEG on the left uh, with the Colari Pocket, and then the RAW file processed on the right as a DNG. The biggest differences that I see are the preservation of the highlights in terms of their color accuracy. I would say the picture on the right is more color accurate than the picture on the left. The uh, picture on the right with Rachel has a cream off-white shirt and the skin tones look very, very natural. Um, and again, they're flipped here. Uh, as you can see, the bigger one uh, on the right, that is the JPEG, has a slightly blue tint to the highlights. But overall, both present a pretty unique look. Um, now that I know going forward, I'll have the raw files. It's not something that uh, worries me too much. So if you enjoyed the video, uh, give it a like, uh, subscribe, drop a comment below. If you've tried an infrared trichromes, I know a lot of people do them with landscapes, but I figured it would be interesting to snap a few portraits and uh, I would give you the challenge of going out and attempting it on your own. Um, just don't forget to adjust the focus for infrared. Outside of that, have a great day.